My name is Keith Collar. I'm the Associate Dean for Strategic Initiatives and Engagement. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here today to the Harvard Graduate School of Education. We are very pleased to be hosting you for the Zantz Early Education Innovation Challenge convened by the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative. This is the inaugural Innovation Challenge. We appreciate your taking the time to spend with us today, both in person and online through our live stream. We have a special event ahead of us as we spotlight innovative approaches to enhancing young children's learning and development and the growth and well-being of those who care for them. Today's event, as well as the entire Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative, has been made possible by the Saul Zantz Charitable Trust. We are deeply grateful to the trustees and we thank them for their generous support, their vision for innovation in early education, and their inspiring commitment to better opportunities for all young children. In addition to the Innovation Challenge, the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative includes a groundbreaking research project, the Zantz Professional Learning Academy, and Master's and Doctoral Fellowships. We invite you to speak with members of the Zantz team who are here today, and to visit our website to learn more about the full scope of this initiative. It's such an exciting opportunity for our school to make a difference in the lives of large numbers of young children. I'd like to recognize the faculty co-directors of the Saul Zantz Early Education Initiative, Noni Lasso and Stephanie Jones. Noni and Stephanie are accomplished scholars, gifted teachers, and extraordinary leaders. They are also true innovators themselves, as is reflected in their leadership of the initiative, for which our school is both grateful and fortunate. So please join me in thanking Noni and Stephanie for their exceptional work. Also, I'd like to extend a welcome to Tom Weber, the Massachusetts Commissioner of Early Education and Care. We appreciate Tom's taking the time to join us today, and we thank him for his leadership here in Massachusetts. The Innovation Challenge was initiated to catalyze, accelerate, and advance new programs, products, and services that bear on the lives of young children and the adults who educate and care for them. When we announced the Innovation Challenge in January, we were hopeful that it would inspire a large and diverse group of entrepreneurs with an interest in early education. We were truly humbled by the response. Over 200 applications, all reflecting innovative spirit and a deep commitment to the field. We were so impressed by all who submitted applications, especially the creativity of the ideas and the collective commitment to serving young children. We thank everyone who applied, we wish all of you well with your ventures, and we hope you'll stay connected with the Zant Initiative. The Innovation Challenge is organized into three tracks. An idea track for new ideas and concepts that are emerging, a pilot track for ventures with new products and initial funding, and a scale track for products poised to expand their impact. We received outstanding proposals across all three tracks, and the finalists who are presenting today emerged from very competitive pools to reach this point. So congratulations to all of you who will be presenting today. At the end, today's event will proceed as follows. All of the finalists in the track will present their projects. They'll have three minutes for their formal presentations, and there'll be three minutes for questions from the judges. We will transition as quickly as possible from one presentation to the next. At the end of the presentations for each of the three tracks, we will collect the judges' scores and we'll ask you to rank the presentations as well. So your scores will be factored into the final judging. There'll be a brief break of no more than 10 minutes to tabulate the scores, and when we return from the break, we'll announce the winners in that track. We're very fortunate today to have five outstanding judges who bring impressive experience and expertise. Their bios are included in your programs and I encourage you to read more about them. For now, I'd like to introduce them to you. Meredith Rowe is an associate professor at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Ron Haskins is a senior fellow and holds the Cabot Family Chair in Economic Studies at the Brookings Institution. Junli Lee is the Rita M. McGinley Professor of Psychology and Human Development at the Fred Rogers Center, St. Vincent College. Mariela Paez is an associate professor at the Lynch School of Education, Boston College. And Lisa Vanderpool is a vice president at Inc. House. So please join me in recognizing and thanking our distinguished group of judges. Thank 
I want to thank the Zantz Initiative team, especially Madison Probus, who have worked so hard. They've worked so hard to organize the Innovation Challenge and ensure a good experience for all of you today. I want to thank our media and technology team. Uh, they're coordinating the presentations and running the live stream. And I'd like to thank Ed School doctoral student and Zantz fellow, Adam Paro Sheffer. Adam's right here. And he's going to have the important job of being today's timekeeper. <laughs> so as you hear from our finalists this afternoon across all three tracks, you'll note their innovative approaches to high priority challenges in early education. You'll see the hard work that has brought them to this point in their respective trajectories. And you'll see the potential to make the difference in large numbers of young children. And with each of the finalists, you will see the optimism in their entrepreneurial spirit, their exciting visions for a future with better outcomes for young children and enhanced ways to support the adults who educate and care for them. So thank you very much for being with, with us today. We're really glad you're here, and we're looking forward to hearing from all of you. So with that, we're going to get started with the idea track. So please welcome Seeds of Learning, the New Britain Infant Toddler Early Childhood Business Incubator, represented by Robin Lamont Sparks and Tracy Madden Hedesy. Thank you. You have to go. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Hi. Established in 1754, New Britain is in the heart of Connecticut, halfway between Boston and New York City. A spirit of innovation shaped New Britain and helped us become a manufacturing leader in the 20th century. This hard work gained us a reputation as the hardware capital of the world. Building on that spirit of innovation, we have developed a new idea to tackle a real problem facing our community, the lack of affordable, high quality infant and toddler care. Currently, 92% of our children have no access to infant toddler care. And two big issues prevent family daycares from flourishing. First, most of our residents rent homes, and their landlords will not permit, permit a home-based business. Much of our housing stock is also aging and needs significant renovation to become licensable. Let me repeat that 92% of our infants and toddlers do not have access to quality child care. So to address this issue, we've melded together a business model that includes an incubator and individual businesses supported and family daycare centers supported and individuals. By taking this non-traditional approach, we propose to increase uh, the availability of infant toddler care, increase the cultural sensitive child care available, increase women-owned businesses in our community, and ultimately help to revitalize the neighborhoods that have been economically ignored. We recognize the need to integrate best practices into our model, so we've invited partners with documented effective experience in both family daycare support and all our kin and operating small business incubators in our local university. We have engaged our Connecticut Office of Early Childhood about regulation because this doesn't fit the traditional regulation model. Uh, they wanted us to convey their enthusiasm for this project to all of you. But visualize this with me. We want you to picture uh, multiple family daycare businesses all under one roof, each having their own individual space, plus having shared space that they share together, like gym space or, or playground space. Our plan is to train a cohort of four to six new owners for six to 12 months, and then coach them for two years before they become an independent business, and then transition them to the community. This innovative approach of tackling a social issue with a business mindset is one that has not been used in our community. In fact, we haven't been able to find a similar model in the country. But we do believe that with the proper planning, bringing together new thought partners, and a sound business model canvas, this idea will not only be successful, but can be replicated in low-income areas throughout the country. Thank you. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about financing, federal and state dollars. How are you planning on getting the money and what will you do? Yep. 
The Office of Early Childhood, one of the things that they have told us that they're willing to work with us on is a pilot project, which would have an intensive evaluation piece, and they would uh, give us some guidance in advocating our state legislators for some pilot funding for New Britain for this particular project. We're also thinking that, the, and this project will cost about $300,000, $350,000 to get started. That's what we're talking about. And with four to six programmers in it and fully filled, we could estimate that they would make fifty dollars to $70,000 a year. So, so there will be a membership fee that will grow with it, but we've also have many partners private philanthropy associated with our coalition as well, and we would be looking to them to help us support the project. Amazingly, the Congress appropriated $2.37 billion in new money for the mm -hmm. Child Care and Development Block mm -hmm. Grant. We're mm -hmm. probably going to divide it in half for 2018-2019. So Massachusetts should be getting some new money, Connecticut as well, mm -hmm. yep. and if I were you, I'd keep an eye on it. And yeah, we've been very fortunate that our commissioner is very excited about this idea. We've already met with his staff. Um, in fact, we didn't apply for something earlier, and he was mad we didn't because we didn't think we were ready yet. So we know we have a lot of support in the state for to have this happen. Um, just tactically, how quickly could you get this off the ground? Do you have a space identified and just any of those details ironed out? We, we have space identified. We know the first thing we have to do is get some regulation changes. So we have started working with the state on that, and that would we, we have a part-time legislature, so it doesn't come back until January. Mm -hmm. So we've actually started that process. Okay. Um, because if we don't do that, we can't run it at all. And the families that would go there, they will be paying on average less than maybe what what a center based care would have. That's typically yeah. what happens in the in this in this arena. Um, and that's why it would be more affordable. We've also targeted some uh, uh, child care deserts in our community and are looking at, at spaces in those areas to target those particular families. Yeah. Um, I guess, you know, in your minds, what's the biggest challenge that you're facing in terms of getting this off the ground? I would say it's the regulation piece. Yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. it is the regulation piece. But because our Office of Early Childhood is so enthusiastic and seems so vested because they see this as a paradigm change and a, a change uh, for other communities, we can replicate it in other communities and, and who have the same issues that we do. And they really like the idea of women-owned businesses in urban areas because there's, there's just a lot of trickle-down that will go on with that in some of these neighborhoods. So they're pretty excited. Great. Thank okay. you. All right. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. So please welcome Iterate Development using stakeholder voice to create a true impact program promoting maternal child detachment and at-risk mothers, Eric Klein and Kira O'Connor. Okay. Hello, and thank you for joining Keelan and myself for our pitch, Iterative Development, using stakeholder voice to create a true impact program. I'd like you to take a second to just read this quote. This is the description used by Roca, a local organization that works with young mothers, where around three quarters of women lack qualifications or employment, are victims of abuse or have unstable housing, and nearly half suffer with substance abuse. These women are at extremely high risk of developing mental illness, particularly depression. Yet maternal mental health in this context is extremely complex to tackle. In one example, despite overall good long-term retention, attendance to a weekly session for women at risk of depression was only 56%. Clearly, regular mental health follow-up is very difficult. However, the consequences of ignoring depression in these women reaches beyond their generation. Maternal depression is associated with insecure child attachment and childhood behavioral problems that in later life can manifest as substance abuse and depression. So the transgenerational cycle of mental illness simply continues. This transmission is exactly what we want to tackle by capitalizing on time that young mothers spend at organizations that provide support for housing and employment. We propose a small group mother-child psychotherapy program using established techniques such as observation, individual guidance, video feedback, and role play. Sessions are modified to be offered at a drop-in basis scheduled around already on-site existing commitments. 
The small group format builds peer support among young mothers, and the one-on-one -on -one therapist detention facilitates individualized progress through a curriculum. Together, this aims to lead to improve maternal child attachment and long-term positive child outcomes, including social emotional development and mental health. However, all innovative changes come with challenges. And our preliminary works in piloting this program suggests that organizations serving the highest risk mothers are resistance, show resistance to participating in iterative idea development. Their main concern is that vulnerable populations are already hard to engage with, and it's simply too risky to go through the process of trial and error in developing an idea. Therefore, in conjunction with developing our intervention, we want to interview stakeholders to understand how to best engage the process of innovative idea development in the context of the most difficult circumstances. No matter how well an intervention is designed, we believe that its impact is ultimately dependent upon how well it fits the needs of the participants and providers who carry it forward. So our idea is innovative in three ways. Firstly, focus. We are thinking about the challenge differently and targeting downstream, i.e. child effects of maternal mental illness. Secondly, we have adapted aspects of many tested frameworks to combine them for the unique needs of our specific population. And finally, our approach combines iterative development with an understanding from stakeholders of what it actually takes to introduce new ideas into organizations serving highest risk populations. Thank you. Thank you for drawing attention to um, young mothers early on. Um, you, the causal model that you have, right, starting from maternal depression, negatively impacting attachment, and, and then impacting child outcome, what you're proposing is to improve maternal child attachment and thereby improve child outcome. Do you see plausible directions in which the causal direction go the other way, which is that by improving maternal child attachment that you may actually have an impact on maternal depression, which is the cause to begin with? I think, I mean, I think the answer to your question is much more complex than I can do just with in a few minutes. I mean, obviously maternal depression is intensely complex and it obviously depends on the severity of the depression um, as well, um, to what extent it can be amenable to positive social interactions, which obviously depression um, can. Um, the, to directly answer your question, I think that research isn't something that we've focused on um, specifically. We have looked more on the on the direct on the direction that we've looked at. Um, so it would definitely be a really interesting thing to consider in terms of whether there are additional and reciprocal benefits. And it could only help. Um, but the research does show that instead of targeting maternal depression as a whole, which obviously involves intensive psychotherapy, focusing on the transmission has been effective. Studies. And in your stakeholder interview in the application, uh, application, you conveyed how difficult it is to add yet another program to these low-income parents, as well as to the nonprofit ROCA itself. Yeah. And you have some um, adaptations for it. I was just wondering, to what extent can the principles behind what you're proposing be integrated into the broader program of an organization like ROCA who's serving the children, as opposed to just thinking about an, another program being added. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, a, it's a great point. I mean, with Roka specifically, um, their programming at the moment has worked in that the children are often on site, but in more a child care setting while the mothers are doing whatever programming they have. Um, and I think so far their focus hasn't been very mother-child orientated, and they are gradually shifting towards that. Um, and from our discussions with them, as we alluded to in our, in our pitch as well, they are limited through resources as well of going through a kind of iterative trial and error process. Um, and so even, um, I mean, the idea of then incorporating it into the existing programming they have, I think, would be a further step. It's almost a bigger leap yeah. than, um, than introducing a kind of halfway house. And, like. and that's something, too, we'd like to inform through um, process research as well, because it's something that um, other could inform other intervention developers and other groups as well as they try to get to nonprofits. Okay.
We can hear you. I don't think everyone else can. <laughs> Take this one. Hi, thank you, sorry. Um, just on that sort of later on evaluation piece, I wonder what um, what your thoughts are about um, the, the scheduling component of what you're proposing and how you would evaluate that going forward. Yeah, so that's a piece that um, is kind of at the crux of finding something, a sustainable sort of program in this space um, and so uh, there are other programs that have adapted kind of similar approaches like the MOMS program in, in New Haven um, of making use of the time that women have where they are. So to, to um, monitor that, we'd have to do a lot with the organization, with participants um, around when popular times are that they're on site for programming, how much time there is before and after. Um, that's some trial and error stuff we'll have to do for measurement, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you. So please welcome Pinier Park, an off-trail lesson planning guide for educators, represented today by Brandy Cartwright. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I'm Brandy Cartwright. <laughs> head dreamer of Pinier Park, an initiative to bring every child in the country to their local wild space. Um, you might call it the Pokemon Go of outdoor experiential ed. Um, some people call it what happens uh, when Pokemon Go and Pinterest have a lesson planning baby in the park. <laughs> um, but really, what we call it is teaching better and teaching outdoors. That's the Pinier Park mantra, teach better, teach outside for every child. But I want you to take a moment to think about your local park for just a bit. Um, I want you to think about uh, all the nuts and bolts of bringing a class and teaching outside. I want you now to wander away from the playground of that local park and get onto the trail. Now bring 16 preschoolers with you, right? And ask yourself, where are we going? Is there a creek? Is there a cave? How do I know? Are there bathrooms? Where are they? Am I going to get lost? And once I get to where I'm going, what do I do there? And those are the worries that relegate a lot of our students to learning indoors every single day, every year, attached to textbooks and worksheets, right? Attached to their desks. Um, but research says that students shouldn't be desk bound. Research says that children should learn outdoors as often as possible. Research says that the social, emotional, and academic benefits of children for being outdoors is remarkable if they're just given the chance. But skeptics will say, that's an impossible project. You can't bring every child in the country outdoors. But Pinier Park says, no way. Teachers just need the right answers because the wilds are waiting for them, right? Um, the outdoors are only inaccessible when they remain in hiding or only opened up to some children in some private schools. So Pinier Park opens public lands to every single child. It's a one-stop shop that supports teacher lesson planning for the outdoors and inspires schools in every community to engage in wild spaces near them. Teachers, children, and parks benefit. They all win with Pinier Park. It's really easy to get started with Pinier Park. Let's see if we can bring up a link really fast. It's a digital platform that houses lesson plans made by local teachers and artifacts for learning. Photos, videos, student sound bites, blog style representations, they're all there. It also navigates teachers to and from points throughout their local park. Finally, it's searchable by subject, grade level, and landscape feature. It's all there in Pinier Park. And it scales from Forest Park to every park in St. Louis to every park in the country. Thanks. Hi. I, I love this idea of the wild is waiting for you. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Um, I have a question about access. Suppose mm -hmm. you're in an urban setting and you really don't have um, the advantage of taking this opportunity because there are no parks and, and right. you haven't mapped anything near those schools and programs. Sure. 
I mean, it's a very interesting question that needs to be answered within our urban and suburban communities. And I think what's valuable about Pinya Park is it allows those pockets, which are there, right, to be highlighted for teachers, right? A lot of times, teachers who aren't used to teaching outdoors are looking for those spaces or putting in the hours of legwork to find those spaces. That's the hidden part. Right? So Pinier Park allows those places to pop up for teachers so that they can recognize what's available and where it is. It can also be used to highlight cultural centers and other places that have bits of nature that teachers and students can get to. Can you cite any evidence that doing this kind of thing has an impact on any outcome for the kids or for the community? Evidence like um, on the student's end of being outdoors? Yeah. Oh, if, absolutely. If, if you if you yeah. implement a program like this, right. here are the advantages, and there's there are good research studies that show it. Yes, absolutely. So the Children in Nature Network has a wonderful online resource that is a clearinghouse for all the for a lot of the ed, the research that supports outdoor education and the benefits and outcomes for children of all ages. Um, there's a lot of research coming out of the World Forum Foundation as well as they kind of bring kind of that metadata together. The research shows that there's increased language development. It shows that gross motor skills are enhanced with students who have open free play outdoors. There's um, better observational skills, better art, better science, better math when it's happening in an authentic way in open-ended play in wild spaces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if, um, if I'm a second grade teacher, for example, mm -hmm. and I decide I want to try this out yeah. and I go to the website, um, how can I sort of prove or show that involved doing one of these activities with the kids in my class is going to sure. meet some of the standards that I'm trying to meet? Yeah, in the it's curriculum. a good question. We had um, an interaction developer I don't know what that term fully means, um, do a lot of research and ask a lot of questions to public and private school teachers throughout St. Louis from early childhood through high school. And a lot of what they needed was that, how do my lesson plans and how does my engagement with the outdoors show that I'm meeting standards? So part of the website, and it's also a mobile app, allows teachers to look up standards-based lessons that other teachers have done either by grade or by subject area so they can show that it's connecting to the standards that they need to meet. And then how does that differ from just a regular sort of field trip? Yeah, so most field trips outdoors are maybe let's clean the creek and that's about all the teachers got. Or let's play at the playground or have lunch at the park. Um, this allows teachers to understand the inter interdisciplinary options for outdoors, the multiple intelligences for outdoors, because teachers are able to see what other teachers in the area or in their grade, grade level are doing in those outdoor spaces. So it kind of brings up more possibilities without having to look at lots of textbooks and lots of resources. Great, thank Thanks. you. Thank you. So please welcome building single points of entry that serve families and communities, Lisa Q and Jill Dixon. Hi Lisa. Hey Jill. So, summer's coming, and like many of you, I thought I'd get some lightweight pants. Oh, me too. I wonder where we could get some pants. That's the thing. I don't know. I don't even know where to start, or what the choices are. Is there a place near my house? I don't even know what I can afford. I wonder if there's a way, using technology, that we could find the pants we need. Oh my gosh, that already exists? Who knew? But we aren't here to help you get pants. Turns no. out you can already do that. Because of our work in early education with the Talley Foundation and Lisa's work with Somerville Public Schools, we know that the reality is that it's easier for us, two people with very different needs, incomes, and geographies, <laughs> to get pants that fit than it is to find quality childcare that meets family need. The reality is that right down the road in Somerville, it was easier for a woman to bring her aunt from Mexico to watch her child so she could return to work than it was for her to find full day care. The reality is that families fear losing their jobs because they can't find care. The reality is that there are a disproportionate number of children birth to age five living in poverty because their parents cannot find work. The reality is that a significant number of parents report that they hear about programming through word of mouth. And the reality is that families of all income levels have no idea where to start. So, if the technology exists to purchase clothing or take a class online or create an international space station, then we can develop a single point of entry applying global strategies and 
technical solutions to local early education spaces. Yet the early education field is often isolated from the kinds of innovations that positively impact other sectors. Bringing elements of successful single point of entry models to early childhood education in Massachusetts is a logical step toward helping to upgrade the field. So picture this, an effective multi-purpose system that serves families from all income levels where families easily get multilingual and accurate timely information and they're directed to and can register for subsidized slots in quality programs and they get the face-to-face -face resource and referral that blends technology and a personal touch and it's nimble enough to expand to other areas like out of school time and comprehensive services and you can do it at home or in the library. So what are we going to do? Team Tally has decades of experience in technology and business, and we have a strong track record supporting early education access for underserved families. Merging these two worlds is our strength. So we'll partner with our brothers, sis, brothers and sisters in the tech world, we'll use Somerville as a sandbox, and we'll build on their work with the Education Redesign Lab here at Harvard and the district's strong family engagement. So the next time you shop online and you get what you need, think about all the families who could benefit from both technology and the personal assistance they deserve to find the care that they need. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thanks for really thinking about what parents need. I, I, I think in a mixed delivery system, having um, all the options available to you would be really important. Um, I have a question. You mentioned in your proposal that the system can be multilingual. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about how you might provide access to um, the information in multiple languages? Right, so easily in a couple of ways. One is that the, the technology behind it, which many websites have already, you can choose your language and get the pull up the registration information or the information about the centers and have it translated into your language. And the other piece, as you saw in the photo, is that there may be people who would rather or need someone to be with them, so it doesn't take out that personal piece of it. Let me follow up on that a little bit. I've always wondered about this. Do all the families have computers? And I know that something like 90% of Americans do, but I would assume low income or less likely. And maybe they don't have the technical know-how. Do you have to train the parents? Do you have to help them get computers? How does that work? That's a great question. And so Lisa mentioned that it can be accessed from home or from a library, because we're not assuming that they all have a computer, number one. Number two, um, there'll be a mobile version of it as well, in terms of being on their phone, because a lot of our families do have phones as their only means of communication. And then lastly, as Lisa mentioned, there's still a face-to-face -face component of this, where they can come into the, norm, the typical agencies that they work with and still get that face-to-face -face sort of hand-holding that they need. Right, we would need, the single point of entry is a physical space, and it's a, a, a technological space. A virtual space. Virtual space. Lisa's our tech person. <laughs> I am so not. <laughs> is that the name of the company, Single Point of Entry, just out of curiosity? Or is that just that is not the, the name of the great, company? Great, just, just checking. <laughs> Term. Um, do, you, do, you, do you have a prototype of this yet, or how much money would it take to kind of get a beginning version of this going? So there, there are prototypes in use nationally at this point. Chicago is a really good example. Um, but right now it's very patchwork, right? So each community is developing their own sort of way of doing it based on systems that they may already have in their district or their organization. And so one of the things we want to do, we feel like with um, the money from this award, we could start to do, get some consulting to figure out how can we streamline this and have it be able to apply first locally in Massachusetts and then also nationally. This can be done as an integrated solution and we know that and so this would be the seed money toward us proving that. Exactly. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Clicker. Please welcome Virtual Mama Beale, Marion Frey and Karen Pollock. Good afternoon. Imagine a world where there are no longer early learning deserts, where there's equal access, full access for early learning for all families and children. That's what our idea is about today, Virtual Mommobile, and I would like you to join my colleague Karen Pollock and myself as we describe the pathway to that. Karen? Thanks, Marianne. 
So for 30 years, Maternity Care Coalition has been working in the Philadelphia region to eliminate early learning deserts. And we've done that through evidence-based home visiting programs. Evidence-based home visiting supports families by helping caregivers understand their most important role as their baby's first teacher and ensuring that children are ready to learn. One mom that Marianne and I had an opportunity to meet recently and to watch was Angie. And Angie's a 44-year-old mom. She had a baby and had a very high-risk pregnancy. And we watched as Angie held her baby and looked lovingly at her baby and really was there to nurture and support her baby. And we know that all of those things are the foundation for early learning. Our advocate, Megan, and our advocates are our home visitors. Megan worked very closely to support Angie. And she did that through building a strong, loving, and supportive and trusting relationship. However, we don't have enough advocates to meet all of the needs in our community. We have a large number of families who sit on a waiting list. And that's one of the hardest things that I have to think about every day in my job. Did you know that there are only 5% of families being served through evidence-based home visiting in Philadelphia? There are so many families across our region, across the country, who don't feel comfortable having someone come into their home or who live in fear. And I've spent 18 years at MCC trying to figure out how to support those families. We have an idea. It's called the Virtual Mommobile. And the virtual Mommobile essentially multiplies the impact and scale of home visiting, which has already been proven to be very effective. It meets unmet needs, and it is going to be free, engaging, and interactive with interactive curriculums, face-to-face -face virtual home visits on platforms like Skype, as well as facilitated conversations, podcasts, and video. We employ three revenue streams to fund it, sliding scale, sponsorship through advertising on the, um, on the platform, and with managed care organizations. Organizations. So we would ask that you would help and partner with MCC to eliminate the early learning deserts because early learning will and can change the world for better. Thank you. Yes. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, I have a question because you brought up that statistic about 5%, which seems so remarkably low. Um, I wonder um, what evidence you have or if you've thought at all about how you're going to engage parents, even virtually. Like, So maybe some parents don't want people in their homes, but what? how do you know they're going to want you in their home on their <laughs> device? Right. Right. So we've actually, um, through our existing home visiting program, started to engage, engage and use technology with families. And so we do that a lot through texting. Our home visitors have um, lots of daily, weekly interactions outside of home visits that are uh, using te um, texting as technology. We actually have a research project that demonstrated the effectiveness and had very positive outcomes for um, new moms around weight loss um, right after the delivery of their baby using a texting application. So we feel like technology is, you know, mo new moms are young people, and young people feel very comfortable using this kind of technology. To follow up on that, mm -hmm. if you have every week or every month, uh, several of the projects are like this, do you have data on if the mom keeps coming back, not just the first time, but second, third, fourth, and so forth, or does it tail off? So many of our programs, uh, existing home visiting programs, um, provide services until the, the, child's, the child and the family is three years old. And so if we're starting with families when mom is pregnant, usually five when the mom is about, uh, has about five months to go in her pregnancy, and we're working with them until the child's three. And what we've found is that what keeps families connected is the bond between the home visitor and the, um, and the client. And we think that it's possible to replicate something like that even through technology. 
So uh, thank you for drawing attention to the importance of kind of building relationships mm -hmm. with uh, families through home visiting. So a key component of home visiting, exactly as you said, is the relationship that's built between the advocate and the family. Um, by going virtual, mm -hmm. right, do you foresee any challenges in forging, especially in the beginning, that strong relationship? And then two, uh, going virtual, is it primarily driven by the cost issues? Or is it driven by some of the things you mentioned, which is that you actually think, even in traditional home visiting, that some component of virtual communication would actually enhance the quality of the home visiting relationship? Both. <laughs> yeah, both. We want to get to unmet needs, and we need to get this out to more people. So that's essentially going to answer both those things. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>
everyone, welcome back. Thank you so much for all your votes. Thanks for uh, indulging us the 10 minute break. So I'm gonna announce the winners in a second. Before I do that, I just wanna thank Rosa Guzman in the back. Rosa, raise your hand. Rosa is tabulating all the judging back there. So I just wanna, Rosa, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm gonna announce the winners from the idea track. Like as I announce your enterprise, please come up to the stage so that we can recognize you. Uh, we'll take formal pictures at the end of the day, but we wanna give you a chance to uh, be recognized by the group. So our third place winner, building single points of entry that serve families and communities. <laughs> Our second place winner, Pin Your Park, an off-trail lesson planning guide for educators. And our first place winner for the idea track, Seeds of Learning, the New Britain Infant Toddler Early Childhood Business Institute. Great so job. Much. So, can we get a round of applause for our Idea Track winners? Great. Thank you all. We're going to get you back at the end. We'll do some pictures, but for now, we're going to move on to the pilot truck. So, our first enterprise for the pilot track is the Louisiana Early Childhood Leaders Fellowship, represented today by Emmy O'Dwyer. As a child care director for 10 years, I know that I changed lives. But I also changed mop water and air filters, staffing structures and accounting systems. A child care director has numerous responsibilities and it's low wage work led primarily by women. Yet where would we be without child care centers and the directors to lead them? Too often child care is seen as just a service and not for what it really is, the foundation of children's education. We know that when children participate in quality early learning, they're more likely to graduate from high school and have stronger social skills. Child's play is actually powerful human interactions where teachers are shaping children into adults who are confident, curious, kind, and engaged. And yet directors are often guiding this work in isolation with little professional development or support. The Louisiana Early Childhood Leaders Fellowship seeks to change that with the tools to transform child care directors into educational leaders. Louisiana is my home where more than two thirds of children are disadvantaged. Some good news is that in 20, 2012, we passed groundbreaking legislation that allowed us to see the quality of emotional and instructional support in every publicly funded classroom. We've ramped up our teacher credentialing and have made progress, but we have a long way to go to get children ready for kindergarten. Our instructional support is unsatisfactory. But with over 1,000 child care centers licensed to serve close to 80,000 children, we believe training directors to coach their teachers will move that needle. So what would it look like if we train child care directors like the educational leaders they are that can change children's futures? Our 12-month leadership training program is the kind usually reserved for executives, like I could have used. With over 160 hours of dynamic training content, 80 hours of job embedded coaching, and a peer-based community of practice. We will bring together directors to learn from each other and promote a bold vision driven by quality interactions with children. Directors will leave our program as educational leaders in their centers, communities, and the nation. Join us with a $15,000 investment in the Louisiana Early Childhood Leaders Program. 
partner with child care directors to change the lives of children, one powerful interaction at a time. Thank you. I think it's an impressive paper and it might work. Uh, but let me ask you a related question. That is, first of all, can you improve directors without reducing turnover? And can you reduce, reduce turnover without increasing salaries? So I believe our program could drive at both of those things. Because first of all, what we're looking to do is change the way directors engage with their teachers. Instead of emphasizing their performance and accountability, what we're really trying to get at is how we can cultivate places of learning for all levels, right? So it's a safe space for children to grow and learn and be nurtured. It's a safe place for teachers to grow and learn and be nurtured. And directors themselves can be vulnerable and be learning something new as well. We're also going to have a component of supporting overall program quality, which we believe is gonna help directors find extra money as they learn how to budget stronger and, and um, understand the importance of the iron triangle of running their business so that they have strong business practices that can support this instructional quality as well. Great. Um, great program. Thank you for focusing on directors. We often see a focus on teachers, but rarely on directors, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask you, how will your program deal with the different levels of experience and preparations that directors bring mm -hmm. with them? That's really important. So we believe it's important to have a diverse group in our cohort because we recognize that diversity is an opportunity to learn lots of different approaches to similar problems. So we don't want to have just this sort of cadre of rock stars, but we do want Teach, we want directors who have participated in some of what we've already offered, including class reliability training, who have begun to adapt their learning and have shown a growth mindset. Um, but beyond that, we really want to create a diverse cohort of those who want to learn and want to invest in their own learning. Thank, Thank you. Next, please welcome Play Interactive Choice Board, Kimberly Reagan. Hi, thank you. There's an increasing gap between the accountability movement and developmental learning theories. With accountability, we often see traditional method, methods of instruction being pushed down to younger students, which results in increased whole group direct instruction, and rote memorization of facts. Are you ready to change this? I am. The Play Interactive Choice Board bridges the gap between accountability and developmental learning theory. It's designed to support instruction that influences non-cognitive factors, increases engagement and achievement, and maximizes instructional time. The model supports a center-based environment where accountability is embedded within the daily life of the classroom through play. Learning centers are individualized and differentiated based on standards, modalities, depth of knowledge, and interests. Once students learn the procedures using choice boards and are familiar with centers, students engage in, in learning with minimal teacher direction, and teachers are able to pull small groups, work with individual students, facilitate inquiry-based learning, and conduct authentic observations. Teachers establish rules and require certain core centers or must-dos each week. Research proves that students are able to self-regulate and make choices to meet the requirements of completing must-dos within an established time frame. The board is a high-resolution graphic touchscreen mounted in the classroom. Teachers design and control display and capability features. The ICB is a multicultural language capabilities, which provide information through an avatar teacher host named Ada after the first computer programmer. Students design their own avatars for choosing centers they attend. They earn engagement points for working in centers and points are banked for avatar accessories. The ICB tracks student selections, generates data, and aggregates by student or center. Data reveals engagement, decision-making, and time management skills, which support agency, self-regulation, metacognition, executive functioning, student preferences to make decisions, instructional decisions, and for dialogue with families. The Play Learning Management System and Interactive Choice Board has been in the works for 21 years, yielding positive results towards scalability. 
The initial target market is kindergarten, which will ultimately lead to a national rollout at approximately 1.75 million students. The ICB is adaptive across grade levels, where scalability can impact 3.5 plus million P3 students. There are no existing interactive choice boards on the market. However, development will bring competitors, so timely rollout is essential to dominating the market. This is a game changer. The team involves a consortium of key players representing several organizations. Partner and supporter feedback yield re positive results which increase the validity and scalability of the scope and sequence. Funds will be used to develop the Play Interactive Choice Board prototype for a kindergarten classroom using an iterative process. Successful development of the prototype will lead to further research and acquisition of funds for a national rollout. So please join me in bringing play into the classroom. Thank you. Thanks. Um, can you say a little bit about why uh, you think using this avatar approach would improve children's self-regulation and executive function, for example, more than putting the little tag on the board? Right. And so you bring up a good point. There's a secondary problem in the United States, and that's looking at engagement. And we know that engagement increases achievement. And so looking at ways that we can engage students more by promoting the avatar piece where they actually can earn engagement points towards accessorizing their avatar. avatar. We're um, doing a few things there. Instead of giving students surveys, which is what's happening nationally when we're looking at school report cards, we're giving them surveys on whether or not they're engaged in school. And any of you who work with kids know if you ask a third, day, third grader one day if they're engaged in school and you ask them the next day, it's going to depend on what's happening that day. And so what this does is it tracks engagement behind the scenes because we're now starting to see where students are selecting to go. And so with the must-dos that I mentioned, teachers actually can set up five or so must-dos in a week, depending on age level, I'm talking about kindergarten. And if students um, start to learn to regulate their time within a week's time frame, then we can start to see, is the learner someone who chooses one a day to get through all those five required centers when they have a choice of 20 or 25 centers? Or are they a student who gets them all done at the beginning of the week? Or are they the procrastinator who waits until the end of the week? And so now we can start to make instructional decisions and coach students into using their uh, skills in order to make decisions as they go throughout their life. And then they start getting, um, you know, their, their um, uh, more responsible for their own education instead of the teacher ringing a bell or having them put on colored t-shirts and forcing them to do mass group rotation, which is like herding cats. I like that. Um, I like that you can gather the data. Mm -hmm. That's, I, I think it's great that you can gather that data um, in a timely way. Can you tell me what are some of the pilot measures? So you're gonna pilot this mm -hmm. um, program. What are some of the measures that you think will be important for collecting data beyond what the program is already collecting? So we already have been using the model that takes place in order to in implement the um, the actual technology piece, the interactive choice board, using choice boards in our school. So we started the first pre through eighth grade charter school in Nevada 20 years ago. And so we use this choice model in our school. And so with that, we are looking at, um, you know, student preferences to learning, which contributes to their workforce development in the long term. And you can start looking at how the learner learns. You know, it opens the door to a lot of different research pieces of what we can study. Uh, for something like that, the, the choice board, mm -hmm. um, is that meant to just be used all day or are there uh, also breakout lessons or is this something that is kind of meant to be going on all day and right. that's how the classroom runs? And so that's going to depend on the model at each classroom. This is adapted across curriculums and what teachers want to use. What we do at our site that we find works really well is our whole group is minimal time, but it's, it's throughout the day. And then what our quality rating system in our state does is they look at much of the day where students are engaged in being able to make choices. And so depending on how your day is structured, we want to look at much of the day teaching them to make decisions. And what the teacher does once they're making their decisions like that is they can now pull small groups and work with students. And students are actually going to the board and deciding where they go next. And they know what their responsibilities are you know, throughout the week. And the key to that is designing every single center based on standards so that when they think they're just going to play and getting away from the must-dos, they're actually learning. <laughs> you know, go figure. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Please welcome the beautiful Stuff Project, Marina Sivak representing them today. Can 
different time. No, no, no. I want to tell you the story of how I became the beautiful lady. 25 years in early childhood education turned me into a staunch advocate for play. I don't need to review the research that val validates the critical importance of play in students' lives, because we all know that. But what we don't know is how to make it happen enough in classrooms today, given the fast pace, sorry, the fast pace, academic demands, and constant assessments. My solution, beautiful stuff, treasure boxes. With our treasure boxes, we ensure play is on the classroom schedule because they are efficient, easy to use, and low cost. They are simple, yet universally engaging. We curate classroom sets, filling each intentionally with small recyclable items that invite children to draw on their natural inclinations and build success. At our first visit, we explicitly model how to use a treasure box. And then we set the children off to create. A kind of magic happens when children have free reign to design and construct. Four years ago, I started making these boxes purely as a labor of love. I casually approached a teacher I knew in Somerville and asked if I could use her classroom as a pilot site. She took one look inside a treasure box and said, they won't know what to do with it. She was wrong. Within the next, within a month, I was all over the Capuano School. By the next year, the, the term the beautiful lady was coined and I was trekking to schools across the city. And this year we served over 50 classrooms in the city of Somerville. Our growth is completely teacher driven. I have never set foot in a classroom without a direct teacher ask. Cambridge got wind of what we're doing and they secured a grant to fund our work and Boston and Everett are now beginning to experience the magic as well. Let's look what happens when Diego digs into a treasure box. So you're going to demonstrate, what are you calling this? A um, jumper. A jumper, all right. When I hear students whisper excitedly, here comes the beautiful lady, the power of our work resonates. I feel deeply appreciated because of what we offer. We bring the play children so desperately need. Importantly, our treasure boxes level the playing field because they are equally accessible to all children, no matter their experiences, their backgrounds, or their challenges. It's never too early to spark curiosity, problem solving, risk taking, and collaboration, all skills integral in today's workplace, especially in the STEM fields. So many of us are thankful for beautiful stuff. Just last week, a child said to me, I really didn't want to come to school today. I didn't remember we had beautiful stuff. I'm glad I came. Thank you for rec recognizing us as we expand our reach, inspiring children and giving them a reason to want to come to school. Thank you. Thank you for being an advocate for the role of play um, in early childhood. Um, I was just thinking that stuff in general, even beautiful stuff, can work better if the grown-ups around the children remember how to play and can play with the children. So I was just wondering in your work so far, how um, have you invested in the grown-ups and helped oh, them to help okay. children? Well, often the grown-ups play with them. And I believe me, I started with like 25 slides because I have so many pictures and many are of the teacher playing. In fact, I'm re right now in a classroom in Everett, a pre-K, and the paraprofessional sits down at the table every day and plays with the kids. And I also um, am lucky to do professional development in the city of Somerville with teachers, and we always start with playing with the treasure boxes. So the teachers, adults need to play as well. It's very calming, therapeutic, everything we know about play. And when teachers have the opportunity, um, they really take it on. 
do you think it would be possible for teachers to someday learn kind of what you do, which is to create their own kind of... <laughs> they do that. Box? So that's, well, right now how we work is we go into um, classrooms in a four-week cycle um, where we bring a different treasure box every week. You can see here are some of our examples. So every treasure box we have is linked with a accompanying children's book, and they also have a journal and a special pen that they can um, write about what they did. And then often, what happens is after we're done with our four-week cycle, like in our grant from Cambridge, there was money in it for materials, so teachers came. To, we, I have a storefront in East Somerville called the Beautiful Stuff Project that has all of these recyclable materials. So teachers come and make their own boxes and bring them back, and I could have shown a million slides of that, but only had three minutes. <laughs> I was just wondering, how many people are you working with or how many employees do you have and how much would it take to kind of scale this up? Because I think it's so cool, but and obviously these are all kind of carefully curated and Very it sounds curated. like you need a lot of help. I have nightmares about <laughs> yeah. these boxes. Yeah, so Stacy, I don't know where she went, is one of my teachers. And I have one other teacher who works with me, um, Catherine, who couldn't be here today. So it's really the three of us that's our team for our treasure box curriculum. Um, we need more teachers, but I need to be able to pay them. And we need a, we need to have a kind of model, business model, I think. but I'm a classroom teacher. I think like a teacher, that's why I think this works, but I don't think like a businesswoman. So that's what we're hoping to be able to use some of the money for, so. I agree with you that we need more play in the classroom. I'm yeah. complete uh, con convert to that. But there's nothing in here about evaluation. Do you have plans for evaluation, or have you already done okay, things? Okay, so, well, that's a great question. And I have tons of anecdotal um, quotes from kids, like this one. And I, I parents stop me in the hall to tell me her kid pops out of bed when he remembers it's a beautiful stuff day. Kids who have said to me, um, oh my gosh, I remember when you came last year on Thursday before lunch. You know, they really, really remember this, we don't, we haven't done any evaluation because that also takes money. Um, so I, but I have been working with Tufts Center for Engineering Outreach, trying to uh, engage a professor or someone who'd be interested in helping us do some evaluation. But all the anecdotal qual um, qualitative uh, says we are really hitting a nerve and it matters a lot. Great, thank you so much. Please welcome Bienvenida Escaleras, Pilar Torres, and Erika Serrano. We're facing a new demographic reality. By 2030, one in three children is going to be Hispanic. In order to remain economically competitive, we depend on today's brown babies. Babies like Julissa. Entering kindergarten with little to no contact with the formal childcare system. Pedro and Sonia are hardworking parents with limited access to quality childcare. They rely on women like Teresita, trusted family, friends, and neighbors who offer the caring relationships that are essential to social emotional development. Although Ter Teresita is unregulated, she is vital for family self-sufficiency because she is accessible, available, and affordable. In Latin America, these women are known madres comunitarias, community mothers. These women face structural barriers that block their ability to become licensed. Digital literacy is needed to complete even the most basic steps toward regulation. So what can we do to empower providers like Teresita to offer the quality of care that prepares children to thrive? Building professional ladders that recognize the contribution of these women to our diverse communities. 
Bienvenidas a Escaleras. Welcome to Escaleras. Escaleras is an innovative training program developed for providers like Teresita. Escaleras transforms un isolated and unsupported babysitters into educators, micro entrepreneurs, and women that belong to a community of practice. Escaleras begins with 10 modules that build their competency into further training. These modules were developed specifically for Latinas, but, but, but we can translate them easily to any other language. Escaleras uses relational training that makes climbing the ladder engaging, interactive, and achievable. Our pilot in Philadelphia demonstrated that with the right supports, providers like Teresita can become licensed and can become engaged and eager learners. We are using human-centered design. We are developing a mobile and digital um, system to help these women access education. We are scaffolding them to digital learning and we are using a system that unlocks functionalities as they become more and more proficient in their digital literacy and in their professional development. We partner with community organizations to deliver this training, to connect the women to family child care networks and to build communities of practice. We never lose sight that meaningful relationships are the heart of quality in early care and education. Fred Rogers said that the greatest dignity of, man, of humankind is that each successive generation is interdependent and, rely, and, and, and is invested in the future well-being of the next generation. We believe that strengthening and surrounding the communities that support these children is not only an early childhood initiative, but it's also an act of social justice. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Oh, well, um, the question. Erika, come oh, back for the question. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, I'm ready to go. <laughs> thank you. Sorry. No, no. Thank you, Erika and Pilar, for this wonderful presentation and thank your you. attention to the Spanish speakers, educators. I think it's a, a really important project. I wanted to ask you, in the pilot phase, what kind of data do you think is important to collect? What measures do you think you'll be collecting to demonstrate the success of this program? I think we need to start by you know, very basic questions like structural outcomes. How many slots are we actually able to open in these communities? I think we need to start looking at how this is impacting the children, which is very, very hard to do, but we have Juliette Bromer's work that shows, she's able to show in a longitudinal study in Chicago that by supporting outcomes for providers, we're able to support outcomes for children. So I think you know, we, we need to start looking at three levels, you know, structural outcomes, child outcomes, and provider outcomes. And provider outcomes can also include economic self-sufficiency for them and for their families. Erika and I ran a program that did this for 12 years. We know that this works, and we know that the women can really step up and get to where we want them to go as long as we offer them, like an airplane, the signals and the, and the pathways that they need. Fantastico. Gracias. Thank you. So you mentioned um, in order to empower the community moms, right, that yes. we needed relationships, meaningful uh, uh, relationships. I was just thinking about in the delivering of the training, um, how does the de delivery of the training as well as the partner that you have in doing so um, help to build meaningful relationships with these community mo moms, moms as well as among the moms as they go forward in this yes. process. In the model that we have developed, we partner with community organizations. So we have a um, hybrid model in which the organization brings a person that not necessarily is an expert in early childhood education, but it, it has some knowledge of it and has connection with the community. So they help. As, um, as a facilitator for the training. They are there, we have the trainings in video, so they will be facilitating the training, going through the manual, doing the exercises, and then they will keep up with the providers while um, they get licensed and in the early stages of setting up their family childcare. 
But I will say that the secret sauce to this model is the cohorts and the relationships that the women build with each other and the leadership that they, they develop amongst themselves. And they start to bring their friends, their neighbors, their sisters into the process as well. So to me, that was the secret. One of one, we have several secret sauces, but that's one of them. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to let you know that the Family, Friend, and Neighbor National Community of Practice was unable to join us today. So that will conclude our pilot track. So once again, we'd invite you to vote. We'll put the link back up on the screen for you. And we will take about a 10 minute break. And when we come back at about, uh, let's say 535, we'll announce the winners of the pilot track and move on to the scaling track. Thanks so much. Can we get another round of applause, please, for the presenters? They did a wonderful job. We'll see you in about 10 minutes.
Welcome back, everyone. I'd like to start by once again thanking all the presenters in the pilot track. Terrific job by everyone. So uh, same as we did before, when I announced the winners, I'd like them to come up and be recognized, and then we'll do the formal pictures at the end of the day. So our third place winner in the pilot track, the Beautiful Stuff Project. Our second place winner, Louisiana Early Childhood Leaders Fellowship. And our first place winner, Bienvenida Escalas. So, once again, congratulations to all of our winners. Congratulations, everybody. So we will now move to the scale track, our final track of the day. And our first presentation will be from Steam Truck, represented by Jason Martin and Bill Schnitzer. Hello, my name is Jason. I am a former kindergarten teacher uh, and now executive director and, uh, an executive director of a Georgia-based nonprofit. And I am excited to share with you our STEAM truck program, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, Arts, and Math. And it's a growing fleet of innovation labs that this past year, we've been privileged to work with even the youngest of makers, ages three, four, and five, where we bring real tools. Now the pain points, if we do this work well, are behind me. But sort of in a nutshell, the reason why we're doing this work is two. One, to eliminate inequities by literally parking what is needed outside the classroom door, and then catalyze and transformation to allow that while we're there, things change so it's not just the status quo. For instance, this is some of the stuff that we do with elementary and middle school students. We've, uh, we've modified for even the youngest designers and engineers. So this is Mr. Sprinkles, the bear, also known as Keith, and he is challenging the kids to both design and build a bed that will fit him just right. <laughs> or Brandon, who's one of our engineers in residence, who's teaching the kids to use renewable energy, wind power, to escape the big bad wolf. So by far, having community experts like Jennifer, who's our artist in resident, or Melanie, who's a scientist, in front of the kids is probably one of the biggest change makers. But this is also a bit of a head fake. The reality is, is that kids don't need to change. They just need access to opportunities. The real value of our work is going into the classroom and working with teachers. Our programs typically last about 20 days, and over the course of 20 days, it's the teachers who have the biggest shift in mindset and skill set. So when we drive away, this approach to learning remains. Two years ago, we served 5,000 students. This past school year, we served over 11,000. 2,500 of them under the age of five. The outcomes are promising. The data behind me are just those under the age of five. And Bill, who's in the wings, who, this is Bill, uh, who's our CFO, would want to make sure that I talk about that our work is uh, sustainable, where about 60% of our revenue is earned revenue, which for a nonprofit is pretty phenomenal. So, in closing, we want to do two things. We want to catalyze uh, and we want to transform and catalyze, and we all want to make sure that we eliminate inequities, and we think we have a solution called Steam Truck that can do that. Thank you. Good job. I was almost right on the time, too. Hi. Hi. That was great. Thank you. It's a really cool idea. Um, 
I wanted to ask, my first question is just, after you've kind of set up that makerspace after the 20 days, mm -hmm. do you have a system to keep track and follow up with that classroom and, and ensure there's still... So uh, so I would say, as a former educator, one of the areas that we need to do better is the traction after we leave. So we do something uh, a couple months later, and we have a survey that teachers do. And I think that's something. And those survey results are promising. But we really, I would really love to know for sure, and that takes both someone's time and energy, to track those teachers a year later and see what has happened. I, I can't look in your eye and say, like, I know that for a fact. But that's definitely the direction I want to go. And then I know that there are other kind of mobile classrooms out there. Um, like Fab Lab. Yeah. 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 yeah um, this is unique, I think, because of the makerspace, but what sets you guys apart? So I think it's a couple things. One is this is what we do. I mean, we are, I mean, to put just tools on a truck and drive it is like saying, like, you can do a school because you put a teacher and a chalkboard. So there's a lot in there that we've figured out. And the second thing is it's all about really change in the teachers. This is an opportunity to really get in there. And so teachers cannot look at me and say, oh, my kids can't do it. We can say, yes, they have. And this is how you can do it going forward. Hi. Hi. Um, that's really great. And actually, you answered a lot of my questions with your slides, so thank you. Oh. Um, but one remaining question is um, just a little more broad. I'm wondering how it didn't really come through so much is how you are um, embedding the A in STEAM mm. in your work? So probably the most authentic way we do that is by actually hiring real artists. So it's not just because we paint a birdhouse that's art, that we actually have that artists, we have a sort of a tripod of staff in where experts like engineers are on one side, STEM designers who are educators are on the top, and then artists, it's its own sign. And that artist is supposed to bring creativity and innovation in the builds that we do. So hiring those real professional artists is the way that we, I think we're most authentic with the A. So you're, um, that's embedded in mm -hmm. a lot of the activities as part of it, or you yep. have separate sort of? Oh, it's embedded. Okay. Yeah, it's embedded in it. It's part of it. Yeah, I want to ask a follow-up question. Do you, do you train them? Do you tell them what you want? Do they come back again and again and they develop expertise? I mean, how do they get to be good at getting those little kids motivated? So are you talking about the teachers that we partner with? I'm talking about the... My staff? No, I'm talking about the people that you bring in from the outside. Aren't there people from the outside, the artists and so forth? Yeah, so the artists, so we pay them. So they are staff, uh, and we pay them competitive wages, which is part of the cost structure. And we train them to do sort of this work. Um, a lot of it's on the ground. But our, I think our core value, I mean, our core value prop is the fact that we have these expert engineers and scientists and engineers and artists. Yeah, there's a pretty strenuous recruiting process that we go through, so... I think time's up, but thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, please welcome Early Childhood Support Organization Initiative, Aaron Lieberman and Rick Meany Reddy. The clicker? clicker? Oh, I think we got it. All right. Hello, everybody. We definitely went with the more is more style of presenting, so we got a lot of info to get through in a short period of time here. But I just want to start by saying Rick Media and I are here from New Profit. New Profit is a venture philanthropy firm that connects breakthrough entrepreneurs who are trying to solve big pressing problems to help them do that at significant scale. Um, I've twice been on the other end where New Profit supported my work. I founded Jumpstart, and then I founded a company called Ocelero Learning. For me, joining New Profit and working as a partner is a part of a personal journey to go from impacting 30 or 40,000 kids a year to 300 or 400,000 kids a year through more of a system entrepreneurship focus. Rukmini? So hi. Um, I think everyone here knows that early childhood education is in the incredible top right hand corner of being fun and effective. And as you can see here, 4.6 million three and four year olds are already in center based pre-k programs, which presents a tremendous opportunity for scale. And we know what works in creating quality. Um, we've listed the three components here. Um, one, being an evidence-based curricula. Two, is integrated training and coaching for teachers. And the third is um, a positive organized classroom. 
So I'm the skunk at the picnic because we know what works in part through the Brookings Foundation work and other consensus statements, but we hardly ever do it in the environments where low-income kids are, particularly around a curriculum and coaching perspective. 80% of the programs that serve low-income kids implement whole child center curriculums that we know do no better than what I call TFIO or teacher figure it out. And effectively, the professional development is often kind of hopes and wishes that someone goes to a conference, comes back with an idea, and somehow shifts practice in their entire center. What we're proposing is something quite different. We want to help evidence-based models that have demonstrated they can integrate curriculum and professional development scale and grow to touch local partners all across the country with a specific focus on subsidized childcare and Head Start. That's going to happen because we're raising $13.5 million to help these organizations scale and grow in what new profit does best. Um, but we're also going to bring a public partner to the table right from the start, a state agency that will commit $10 million of their own funds to ensure there's some sustainability built in. Just to give you a sense of what that's going to look like, on the ground floor level, there's $200 that goes to the early childhood support organization from the state agency on a per child basis for every child enrolled at a program that they're serving. There's $50 that goes an incentive to the uh, agency itself so they have a reason to do it. And the results, that's the peanut butter and chocolate of our world that gets to actually break through outcomes for kids. Lastly, you can just kind of see the bottom bar there going down is new profit subsidy effectively, the new profit grant. The gray bar at the top is the public funds. So you really see the sustainability built in to to ensure that this can happen. And the really good news is our plan shows how to get to 40,000 kids over a five-year period of time and 400,000 over 10 years. Thanks. I think I um, appreciate you drawing attention to the fact that quality has costs associated with it, and that's where the financial incentives are. Um, the broader picture right now in quality is that as the child care providers go up the ladder in quality, their basic economic model goes down, that the higher quality they are, the more likely they're going to be broke. So I'm just wondering, kind of in this structure, how do you, in addition to the technical assistance and training, how do you help them to make ends meet as they go up in quality? Well, they get a modest incentive to participate, but what we're really about, I mean, there needs to be a fundamental reordering of the economic model and how we support high quality pre-K, which we totally support. But in the current environment as it is of childcare and Head Start, we believe that 2%, which is basically that $250, is available in current quality efforts, and we're trying to redirect it. So this effort is not, underli is not hitting the underlying economics, which can be quite challenging. That said, in many states, doing the things that we know have a bigger impact for kids will move you along a QRIS continuum, which will hopefully help some programs get greater tiered reimbursement. But we're trying to redeploy the hundreds of millions of dollars that are spent poorly in improving quality right now uh, to make it more focused on the program level. How are you selecting the evidence-based curriculum? Yeah, we, we commissioned a study and really looked at like what do we know are the essential elements that drive impact and quality, and that's what we kind of put together as the criteria for which people are going to apply. So we've done information sessions all across the country, and now we're going to go through a process of selecting those applications and having a kind of a juried process to make sure we get the four best organizations possible. I'm glad you looked so carefully at the funding. That really, that's the strongest part of the presentation you made. Here's my concern. The federal government is going to be cutting. Uh, they have to. They don't have choices. And they're spending a tremendous amount of money. They just spent more than they could afford to do, plus they cut taxes. So, And the state governments are not in any better shape. So are you nervous about the public funding part of this? It's, well, as you noted, I mean, child care just got $2.6 billion, so it's moving in the other direction as of late. But Head Start has been remarkably resilient. There's only been a single cut. That was the across-the-board cut that all discretionary programs had and has only seen increases for the last, you know, literally 50 years. So early childhood has done better than most in that. We're not sanguine about it, but there's also a lot of investment happening at the state level as well. We're good? Okay. Great. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Next presenter is the Leading Men Fellowship Program, represented by Ricardo Neal and Kenvin Lacayo. Welcome. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Kenvin Lacayo. 
I'm a 19-year-old Latino from Washington, D.C., and a member of the Literacy Lab's Leading Men Fellowship. The fellowship is an initiative to engage young men of color such as myself as part of the solution to ensure that every child in our communities receive an outstanding pre-K education and see male role models who look like them. Fellows are recent high school graduates who receive rigorous training and coaching in evidence-based early literacy intervention and social emotional development and commit to spending a year embedded in an early childhood classroom in their community. We have three goals to prepare our students for kindergarten, to diversify the teacher workforce, and to open the eyes of young men to the possibility of careers serving our youngest and most vulnerable children. Thank you, Kenvin. Good evening, everyone. My name is Ricardo Neal, and I have the great honor of working with phenomenal young men like Kenvin. I am a 45-year-old Jamaican immigrant and a product of my beloved Lawrence, Massachusetts. Kenvin and his colleagues are groundbreakers. The workforce serving 4,000 children enrolled in DC Public Schools pre-K programming includes only 13 men of color. A 2006 study by the US Department of Education found that the national teacher workforce is comprised of just 5% men of color, although our student population is a majority of students of color and half male. Why am I such a fierce advocate for the fellowship? I didn't see a teacher who looked like me until high school. Without engaging young men of color such as myself and my colleagues in the fight for the future of our country's preschoolers, I can promise you that we will never achieve the outcomes that we hope for. Oh, and there's concrete evidence that what we are doing works. As you can see here, a 2017 study showed that my colleagues and I were able to flip the script and achievement for black and Hispanic boys in our classroom. Data aside, my colleagues and I are discovering a sense of purpose in serving children in our communities along with the clear vision of a meaningful and productive career. I'm enrolling in college in the fall on a mission, something that I did not feel was possible prior to my work in the fellowship. Ladies and gentlemen, the pool of talent is vast. And I'm here today to urge you to invest in and engage in more young men like Kenvin in this critical work that we do. Kenvin. I stand in front of you this evening speaking not only for myself and the fellowship, but also for young men of color across the country whose talent and desire to invest in their communities should be nurtured, developed, and harnessed to drive achievement for young children. I think of one of my students who started the school year biting, kicking, and screaming, and threatening me. <laughs> I grew up in the same neighborhood as him, so I knew the circumstances he was facing. I never gave up on him, I showed patience, and whenever he wanted to tear the room apart, I hugged him and reminded him how smart he is and that he can make better choices. My persistence paid off. I sat next to him for months every day at lunch every single day and after three months he turned to me mouth full of chicken and said I love you Mr. K. This is why I do this work. This is why I'm here today. Thank you for the opportunity to tell our story and we invite you to join us in bringing the Literacy Lab's Leading Men Fellowship to Skip. Great, great presentation, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think increasing the gender, racial, ethnic diversity of early childhood educators should be a priority for our nation, so I commend you for the program. I, I have a question about research. Um, you presented a slide today looking at the impact of, of the program, and I, I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on what kind of impact you expect on the fellows of colors, not just the children in the early childhood programs. I think that's good. I'll go first, and Kevin, if you want um, to, to add to it. You know, I started out the program by referring young men that I mentored for years to it because I saw that they needed other options. And then after um, seeing the young men after their first year in the program, the language that they use as young professionals, talk about um, scaffolding, what's happening in the classroom, they have more confidence in themselves. They had an opportunity to think about, maybe this is what I want to do for a career, because this is something they had never seen before. So definitely sense more confidence. They saw more options available to them that typically that um, wouldn't be available for, for young men if they hadn't had this exposure. Kenvin? Um, piggybacking off of what you said, I think confidence is a very important thing. As I said in the presentation, um, before the fellowship, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to attend a co uh, of college or if I was going to be able to continue my education. Uh, but now with the support of the Literacy Lab, I, I, I'm, I truly feel like I can do that and I feel empowered and I think that that's a very important uh, thing for the fellows. Um, give us some specific examples of what you 
give us some specific ideas about what precisely you do to recruit these young men? Because I know many other people have tried, and they've had a lot of trouble recruiting young men. They have trouble finding ones with the right qualifications. And when they find them, they have trouble getting them to join a program. And they have trouble getting them to stay. So how do you address all these problems? The young men are out there. I was a high school administrator for six years. Um, I travel the country now as we expand the program, going to different high schools and talking about the program, talking about what the opportunities are. We look for young men, if there's an adult in their life, if there's mentors working with them. Now, tell me about those relationships and we're really targeting those folks. We don't require you to have a 3.5 GPA or anything like that. We look for you to be committed. We look for you to want to reinvest in your community. We go out, and it's hard. Like, I'm not saying that it's an easy thing to do, but we go out and we talk to them. Once they're in, it's a very high-touch program. And Ken, I think you would say I'm pretty invasive in terms of what's going on <laughs> <laughs> in your life to ensure that I understand all the environmental effects in terms of what's happening and making sure that they're sticking to it. Um, the first cohort we finished with over 80%, and we're about done in the, um, this current year, and um, nine of the 10 are remaining. So it's just been very high touch in terms of the work. Thank you. Thank you both very much. So please join me in welcoming access to quality for all, empowering early childhood and PK-12 stakeholders Andy Canales, representing them today. Good evening, everyone. My name is Andy Canales, and I am the Research Director at Children at Risk. We are a statewide research and advocacy organization in the state of Texas, and we do work in education, health, human trafficking, and parenting. And I am here today to talk to you about childcare deserts. So as many here in the room know, 90% of the brain develops before the age of five. And we have a big challenge in the state of Texas because we have many, many children who don't have access to quality childcare. Now, if we can solve this in Texas, then we can do a lot of great things across the country. Uh, not to sound braggadocious or anything, uh, because I will be humble about some of the challenges that we're facing. But one in 10 children in the United States that is born is born in the state of Texas. Additionally, uh, we have over 200 million additional dollars that are coming into the state of Texas with the increase of the child care uh, development bl uh, block grant. Uh, so the question is, how do we improve access to child care? Now, I want you to imagine that you are one of the 180 state lawmakers in the state of Texas, as difficult as that may be to imagine. <laughs> Where do you start? The data is housed in so many different state agencies and organizations. So what we did is first we collected data from three state agencies 1,100 school districts, yes, that's right, hashtag local control, <laughs> one federal program and two nationally accredited programs to estimate the number of children that are living in childcare deserts. And that is 286,000 low-income children in the state of Texas. So now our job is to make this data available to state lawmakers and community advocates. So we created what is called a child care desert map. It does not have the sexiest of names, but it does provide a lot of really great information to people. And you can see on the right hand side an animation of what you can access on this map. You can see child care desert data by zip code, four different types of deserts, different types of child care providers. You can zoom in by county and district. However, there is more that we can do, and we're already seeing the impact. Already organizations are using this to build childcare facilities in many deserts across the state of Texas. With your continued funding, these are the different ways that we can improve this map, especially breaking down this data by political boundary, including racial demographic data, so that we can share with our policymakers information and facts that they need to improve the state of childcare and let me tell you, we need more facts and data in the state of Texas. I hope you can support us in doing that. Thank you very much.
This is great, thank you. Um, can you just say a little bit more about the types of centers that are included in your data base? Is it including like family-based centers or is it just accredited centers or? Yeah, absolutely. So we define a childcare desert where um, a region is able to meet less than one third of the demand of uh, low-income children and working families. So in calculating supply, we took into account public pre-K, we took into account Head Start, we took into account uh, nationally accredited centers, and we took into account our QRIS rated child care centers. And so especially that um, is what the state of Texas is focusing on. It's called Texas Rising Star. And those are the four different types of deserts. So you can see uh, uh, Texas Rising Star rated level ones, level two, level three, and level fours. It does not include uh, home base or uh, registered uh, home base uh, center uh, because we don't, uh, we don't consider that, that it's not part of their, the QRIS system. Okay, and then does that system give you access to quality ratings of the centers as well, or no? Yes, so we uh, access data from uh, the Texas Workforce Commission and the Texas Department of Family and State uh, Protective Services, and you can see exactly where the level ones through four Texas Rising Star Centers are. And believe it or not, if you're a politician, right, or if you're a community advocate, and you want to access this information in Texas, you have to download spreadsheets. And no one's going to do that. So this is our first step in solving this problem. This will be hard for you to do, but imagine that there are two people in this audience that doubt that those uh, policymakers in Texas really want to know this material, and that they will direct the funds where it belongs. What are you going to say to them to convince them based on your experience. And no, they will pay attention to it and they will use it the way we intended. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing is that um, in the state of Texas, we often want to pretend that problems and challenges don't exist. And so the first thing that we do as an advocacy organization is try to visualize the data and tell stories so we can raise awareness just generally in the community and through media, and especially as we interact with each of the policymakers across Texas. Uh, some of them are receptive, some of them are not. Now, the thing about Texas is we do value local control. So a few years ago, you saw San Antonio with Mayor Julian Castro uh, take matters into their own hands and essentially create some level of universal pre-K. There is similar talk in Houston. Uh, Dallas, as well, is doing uh, very innovative things. So this information, even if our state lawmakers are not responsive, will go a long way in helping local advocates uh, and decision makers as well. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next presentation will be leveraging text messages to support early childhood development and parental resilience, represented by Jared Wigdor. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jared Wigdor, and thanks for the opportunity to share a little bit with you about Bright by Text. So I don't have to hit the audio file for you to know the sound that's coming out of that baby's mouth right now, right? And anyone who's been a parent or caregiver of a young child knows what it's like to have a fussy, screaming, inconsolable baby at 3 o'clock in the morning, and you don't really know what to do about it. Now, a lot of parents will go put it into Google, or turn on the light and flip open a parenting book to try to find information. But we're finding parents and caregivers are overwhelmed by the quantity of information out there. But when they dig in, they're underwhelmed by the quality of the content and resources that are available to help them tackle these problems. Now, if you were a parent or caregiver who was signed up for Bright by Text, you would already be receiving between two to four messages a week targeted to your child's age and stage of development. Like this one, for example, that arrives when your child is 45 days old, offers empathy to the parent or caregiver about how challenging it is to listen to your baby cry, and then tried and true tips and resources to help them address that challenge, get the baby back to sleep, and get the parent back to sleep. This is a two-generational tool that helps support the resilience and development of both the caregivers and the children. And it's uh, since last year, over the last 13 months, 
We piloted Bright by Text in partnership with seven PBS stations all across the country. And the result has been over 35,000 subscribers in each one of the 50 states all across the country. And that's, again, with only doing some targeted promotions in seven communities, which means a huge portion of our population is coming from that organic growth, the word of mouth. Folks that are hearing a promotion in New York City and telling their friends in Hawaii who have a young child that this is a program that would really serve them well. What's amazing is that it's not just for those end users, not just for the families with children that they really benefit from this platform. It's local organizations like the other awesome finalists in this challenge I get to share the stage with today that are doing their own work with organizations, with families in the community, like a local library branch in Dallas who had single digit attendance at their toddler story times. We send a targeted localized text message to regional zip codes near that local library, announcing that this was a resource for the community. Over 30 new regular attendees, including two single moms that that librarian has told us uh, recognized each other at a couple of these visits, formed a friendship, and now have built their own community of support uh, just with each other through these resources that they found through Bright by Text. Again, Bright by Text brings together targeted messages based on the child's age, local messages provided by partner organizations that connect families to concrete resources, comprehensive content from prenatal up through age five, we're gonna to extend to age eight, coming from partner organizations like Vroom's Brain Building Activities, PBS Learning Media, and so many others who are contributing their own expert content to the platform. We've got robust data that we're just scratching the surface here, we'd be happy to answer more, an ongoing relationship over years with parents and caregivers, and ultimately a cost-effective platform. Fully loaded last year, it cost us $20 per caregiver to deliver two to four messages a week for the entire year, which means a $15,000 investment today will go directly towards getting another 750 families or more leveraging economies of scale onto the system and getting the information they need. So again, 35,000 subscribers, over 3 million messages sent. 92% uh, of the families that we've surveyed say they're more confident in their parenting skills, and 97% would recommend it to friends or caregivers who have their own children. Try it out for yourself. Sign up with the age of a child, or just try the demo if you don't have a child, just to feel out what the sign-up process is, and please spread the word about Bright by Text. Thanks so much. Hi, thank you, that was great. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to hear if you had any stats around, um, I think you had some stats around text sent, but sort of text opened or mm -hmm. anything like that. Yeah. And then I wanted to hear a little bit more about where you get the content from that you're pushing. Great, out. thank you for that opportunity. So I'll start with uh, text sent. It's not like email, so there's no read receipts. Uh, from closed environments, Pew Research has demonstrated that 90. 97% are opened, 90% within three minutes of receipt. So it's the most interruptive form of communication. What we can measure is not open rates, but what we call click-through rates. So there's an embedded link within each message that links to, uh, in, often, in many cases, a short modeling video, related resources, the research behind the tip. And on those messages, we're able to measure the clicks through that engagement. Industry average for SMS marketing campaigns is about 6%. Our, our core content, that was messages based on child's age, received between a 25 to 40 percent click-through rate, meaning that a, a really high level of engagement with that additional material. What's amazing is those localized messages, those resources directed to zip codes about concrete community resources, sometimes get click-through rates exceeding 100 percent, meaning the families went back, you know, they got it the day before, and then they went back the day of to make sure they had the right information so they could show up to that the health fair or toddler story time, so really high level of engagement from what we can see with the click-throughs. We're not just trying to get clicks. Uh, we know that a lot of the core messages, uh, even if you don't have access to data or a smartphone, come just through that 140 character bubble, but we're seeing a really high level of engagement with those clicks. Uh, in terms of the content, Bright by Three is an organization that's delivered a home visitation program for over 20 years in Colorado. So our core content between zero and the zero to three comes from that same curriculum that we've used with Colorado families for, for decades. Uh, but it's supplemented with content from the uh, PRD advisory committee uh, who's helped us create pregnancy-related depression content for that prenatal and perinatal range, uh, Vroom brain building activities from the Vroom app out of the Bezos Family Foundation. Cooking Matters has supplied information about uh, nutrition and how to engage children in the kitchen during those early years. Uh, PBS learning media, like I said, some social emotional competence. And we have a 
a content advisory board that helps us review submitted content, and we're constantly reaching out to organizations, and if anyone's got some great content that they think would be great for parents and caregivers, please let us know, because we like to, we really are agnostic to the content. We want to convene the best and brightest so that it gets out to families in one coherent platform and the way they can use it. I know we're running out of time. Can Sorry. you just say a little bit about the demographics of the people that are using the... Uh, Absolutely. the text, like the income and... Yeah, value. so we're just doing some evaluation right now where we're asking folks to self-report some of those things. Uh, for example, we had about one-third indicate that they have a household income below $50,000 and almost two-thirds that was below $75,000. So we know even with a universal pro program that's available in both English and Spanish for anyone who cares for a young child, that we are reaching that segment of the population that needs the support the most. Thanks so much. Thank you. Our last presenters of the day, <laughs> uh, focus on early learning, Jason Sachs and Abby Morales. Hello, friends. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, and then I'm going to let Abby tell you about the content. Um, so uh, basically, I worked in a community-based program for five years, and then I went and worked in the State Department, uh, Massachusetts State Department of Early Learning Services, where we focused on research and evaluation, zero to five work, um, all the way from home visiting, all the way to uh, kindergarten grants. And then I was hired by the Boston Public Schools to think about expanding preschool programs uh, for four year olds across the city in, um, in uh, the Boston Public School classrooms, but since then we've worked um, to think about community-based programs. So with that said, um, we spent a lot of time improving preschool programs in the Boston Public Schools, and, and we did a strong uh, evaluation of it, and we found out it made a big difference in uh, early childhood programs. Um, but then we started looking at kindergarten and going, huh, everything we do in preschool, we make this nice difference, um, but everything we do in uh, preschool doesn't work in kindergarten, so we have to think about improving kindergarten programs. And then we spent the next five years actually going beyond kindergarten and really thinking about first and second grade. Um, so just to give you a sense of our curriculum, it's really kind of Reggio inspired, but with a strong research and evaluation uh, component situated in a public school uh, setting. And so now Abby is going to talk about um, our educational program. Yes. So. Okay. So what distinguishes focus as an innovation um, of curriculum is that the curricula is organized not just around content, but around these powerful practices. Um, they're guided by what we know um, of how children learn best, what we believe is their potential, and what is correlated to positive student outcomes and needed skills for the 21st century. Wait, but you know what I forgot to tell you guys? So we want to do this birth to three. We actually want to work in community-based programs and family child care centers with um, students that are pre-K, I mean, sorry, birth to three. So the idea is to take some of these ideas and have them for infants and toddlers. Sorry, I forgot to tell you that. But. So because these are explicit practices, it makes focus not just aspirational, but actionable and measurable and relevant to the zero to three, three-year-olds and the teachers who teach them. For example, discourse with facilitation and feedback might be difficult, possibly comical, to imagine with a two-year-old. But if we understand that uh, children are developing language before they can produce it, then a teacher who is asking the most prominent question in our curricula of what do you notice, that builds a habit of academic discourse, but more importantly, confers upon that child the status of an active learner with valuable thoughts and ideas. And so focus really is not just a boxed curriculum, but a way for teachers to think about, think outside of the box. Thank you. <laughs> Let's get to this guy. <laughs> so in adapting the curriculum from mm -hmm. the pre-K down to first to three, yep. so we not only have a difference in age, developmentally, right. but we also have a difference for setting. Of course. And so I was just uh, uh, curious to hear more about kind of how do you adapt to the setting of mm -hmm. community-based ba organizations, mm -hmm. and how does 
the values and strength of these community organizations kind of get into the adaptation process. Mm -hmm. So do you want me to hit that structurally and then you hit it content-wise? Okay. So structurally in the city, we are uh, working towards developing a universal preschool system. We serve about 2,900 kids. There's another 1,000 to 2,000 kids that we're gonna serve in community-based settings and in the public schools. And we had a preschool expansion grant, so we've been working with community-based providers. And so Abby's actually done a lot of the coaching of the curriculum for four-year-olds. And that's sort of our first in in working in that setting. Compensation is still gonna be an issue. It's covered with preschool, but it's not necessarily covered from the zero to three population. But I think having the impact of a public school setting there might up that dialogue, which would then hopefully lead to more compensation issues, but now finish. Um, yes, and so our base model of curriculum, coaching, and professional development has been duplicated in community-based settings for the past seven years through the Boston Kids Grant and through preschool expansion. And some of the anecdotally, um, what we know has happened, that even though we were working primarily with the four-year-old classrooms, we notice and directors and teachers tell us that the three-year-old classrooms are using some of the same practices because they're seeing uh, what a difference um, uh, it makes in in those classrooms. And so it's already sort of, uh, you know, uh, rippling out. And so with this, we can make it a more formalized um, uh, uh, relationship and a little bit more hearty. I just wanted to hear um, some specifics about how you're going to scale the program. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to leverage our existing relationships with our community programs. Um, we have a great reputation, both nationally and internationally, um, because I think our, our model is not only efficient, it's effective, and it's really elegant, because it already fit, it will fit into a variety of settings. And so working with our, our programs that we already have a relationship with, I think that's our, our natural um, organic breeding ground to, to scale that up. And then also, um, again, because we're opening up a universal preschool system, that'll give us access to 50 to 100 more providers, and some of those providers have family child care systems, and I think we're going to work with the state as well to think about how do we get this information out for infant and toddler programs uh, across the state. So that's the scale piece. But first, we have to build sort of some of the tools that get kids and families into a place where it's like, oh, this is what they're going to be learning in the public schools, and this is how we can start aligning it. Our time is up. Thanks. <laughs>
Okay, if I could just have everyone's attention one more time. So I just want to do a couple of final thank yous and then we will announce the winners of the scaling track. First of all, thanks to all of you. You've been a great audience. Thanks for voting along with us this afternoon. I hope you've enjoyed it and we've been really thrilled that you've stayed with us. So thank you for that. Um, I want to thank Noni and Stephanie for launching the Innovation Challenge and for uh, setting us on this path. I want to thank our terrific panel of judges. What they did today was very difficult to do in three minutes of presentation and three minutes of questions and 15 presentations. It was, it was quite a bit. So thank you all so much for being with us. And just I want to thank, again, the media team. Everything worked beautifully. So guys, excellent job. And everybody with the Zantz team, and especially Madison and Rosa and Adam, who were great partners in this. So thank you all. So, you know, I think today we really gained insight on the many different ways that it's possible to serve young children, the adults who educate and care for them. We saw so many different innovative approaches to making that happen. We also saw in all of the teams an entrepreneurial spirit, an optimism, and really a better future for all young children. And I think we leave here today encouraged and ready for the good work that lies ahead of us. So I really salute all of the finalists. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us today. So in the scaling track, our third place winner, Steam truck. Our second place winner, leveraging text messages to support early childhood development and parental resilience. And our first place winner, the Leading Men Fellowship Program. Let's one more big round of applause for all of our winners, all of our finalists. We would like for all of the winners to stay in the room. We're just going to do a few pictures, so if you'd be willing to stay a little while, we'd appreciate it. For everyone else, there is a reception up on the second floor in the L.A. Lyman room. We hope that you'll join us and celebrate what has really been a terrific and inspirational day. Thank you all so much. We really appreciate it. <laughs>